Hi there, I'm Pam Quile, and we're here at Quile Kilns Pottery. We've had, been having a lot of fun the last uh, week or two, working on a project here that we've never done, and we're doing Raku Firing. Raku Firing is a, uh, originally a Japanese technique, and the American funk potters have taken it to whole new levels of um, uh, delight. And so uh, we have a group that's meeting here today to use a raku kiln and uh, decorate their pieces and create uh, just wonderful, fun, uh, exciting wear. So we're going to enjoy today and hopefully you'll get a chance to see what this is like and we'll try to have some more workshops for the public uh, this coming summer. So let's take a look at what we've got going. So one thing about Raku that makes it sort of a different thing than the average pottery that you expect to find in your home is that in the process of doing a secondary reduction firing on it, which you'll be seeing, we end up actually fracturing the integrity of the pottery itself. So with Raku work, it's not something that you could ever plan to use as a vase to put water in. You wouldn't use a Raku piece for um, a dinnerware set or for functional wear. The pieces actually have been fractured and are not sound, however they're much more interesting and more lovely. We're, we have a host today who's going to be running this group and that's is Tim Hanrahan and Tim will be getting our kiln up and firing and uh, directing the group today. So you'll see more of him and then how these pieces come about. Hi, I'm Tim Hanrahan and today we're doing a Raku workshop here at Quail Kilns in Murphy's, California. Uh, Raku is an ancient Japanese form of pottery whereby you take fired pieces, bisque fired pieces, put them into a gas kiln, heat them up to 1800 degrees when they're glowing orange hot, pull them from the kiln and place them into a reducing chamber, which is normally a garbage pail, a metal garbage pail filled with combustibles, which would be shredded newspaper, pine needles, sawdust, anything that will create fire. And what happens in that process is that the oxygen in the chamber is actually starved, causing a reducing atmosphere and the fire will actually draw the oxygen and debond the oxygen from the glazes and the clay, leaving the metals on the surface, which you see here, the metallic patina on the surfaces here. You can also use a lower fired clay, a Kono 6 or 1800 degree clay with just regular colors to give you the same effect. And today what we're doing here is we're doing decorating in preparation for a firing that we're going to do in a couple minutes. And you can see folks that are actually painting on sculptured pieces and thrown pottery and using different colors. Now different colors in the mixture of the glaze will come from different metals or chemicals that are in there. You see the blues are generally come from a cobalt carbonate, greens will come from a copper carbonate, um, some yellows and browns may come from rutile or iron oxide, and generally a mix of gerstley borate and colmonite will give you uh, a clear or a white clear clay. Now the process of Raku generally because you're shocking the hot pot coming out of the kiln into a lower temperature ambient air is going to cause the glaze to shrink faster than the clay that it's based on and it will give you a crackling in the, in the finish. And that's a very desirable uh, part of the finish. Um, again, as Pam said earlier, this is artware. Raku is generally artware and is not food safe because the pottery has not been fired at a temperature sufficient to vitrify the clay or to create a smooth surface on the exterior. Now in the old Japanese uh, Raku firings, they used to do a single firing, which we may do later today, where you actually take clay that has not been fired, glaze it, and I'll fire it all in the first firing. And they used this in a Japanese tea ceremony where they fired the pots and then had a tea ceremony following it. So I'll let you look at some of the folks that are doing their decorating and we'll see some of these pots later on in the kiln.
now we've got the pots glazed. We saw that in the glazing room in here. All the artists uh, have done their pots and we're ready to get them into the kiln prepared to fire. This is a really nice kiln. I'll give Laguna a little plug. Very nice raccoon kiln with a slide up, slide down, very accessible for the pots. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, finish loading some pots in here. So we want to put the pots randomly in the kiln with enough spacing so that the heat will be able to flow around them and so that they're not touching each other because if they're touching then the glazes from one will actually stick to the other one. So we want to be careful of getting the kiln loaded and we're finished with that. Saved you a little time doing a little in advance. Now we'll um, fire this kiln. We have a digital pyrometer on here which will tell us the temperature that the kiln is operating at. We need to get to a temperature of about 1850 degrees for the glazes to melt and mature. So we'll monitor that as we go through the process. Right now the ambient temperature is 100. Alright, so now we're going to go ahead and lower the kiln and uh, then we're going to go ahead and get the fire started. So we need to make sure that Chris can come over and help me clear the pots to make sure that we're not going to be touching the outside of the of the uh, kiln as we come down. So he's going to watch very carefully as we come down to make sure that we're not touching. We, how are we looking over there, Chris? Looks good. All right. So minute. No? This is going to have to. All right. That's still touching. Which one? This one. The tube? That should do it. All right. Okay, now we're ready to light this kiln, uh, and it's set up with several different safety uh, mechanisms, which are uh, quite helpful. Um, you're dealing with gas and a lot of fire, so uh, safety is of utmost importance. So let's go ahead and light this kiln here. Well, I'm going to set the microphone down and turn on the gas to the kiln. This is the gas supply coming from the tank behind me. And this is a safety valve hooked up to a thermocouple, which will only go on once the pilot has reached a certain temperature. So Chris is going to add fire. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear the uh, pilot light in here. And, uh, once it gets the temperature, this pilot light should stay on. If I release this button, the pilot light will stay on. And then we'll put on a another pilot which goes to the other burners. You'll see a little fire coming out of all of the burners that we have, the three burners. And, uh, now we have another safety device here that's hooked up to a thermocouple which will uh, fire the burners. So uh, we'll press that down and turn the gas on. And once it reaches temperature, uh, we'll have ignition. In a couple seconds here. Okay, now we have the uh, pots in the kiln. They're uh, heating slowly so that uh, we don't have any explosions, hopefully. Now we get ready to put our uh, reduction chamber together. Now, what I like to do in the reduction chamber is start out with a um, pottery brick or a high fire brick that will withstand uh, the temperatures of the hot 1800 degree pot that goes in here and I'll put that in the bottom of the reduction chamber which happens to be just a, a small metal garbage can and uh, this will create the reduced ox oxygen atmosphere once we start it on fire put, put the pot in we actually put the pot in that catches the materials on fire we put the cover on and that creates the reduction so now we need to add some uh, combustible materials. I put the brick in to raise the pot up off the bottom of the uh, of the container. So first I'm going to put in some shredded newspaper or shreddings from an office. This guy must have paid a lot of bills because he's got a lot of shedding. A lot of shredding. So I'll put a little bit more in. You don't need to fill the container completely. 
spread that around the outside so that the pot can set on the brick. Then I'm going to take some pine needles, which are readily available up here in Calvaris County. And uh, we all have to rake them off our property every year, so uh, we have a good spot to use them. And we'll create what, what I like to call a little nest for the pot. So we'll put this around the outside and, and then we'll be able to set the pot in here. And to make sure that the whole pot gets um, a little bit of fire around it, I'm going to put a little bit of uh, shredded paper in the top and I'll throw that on top before I put the uh, pot in. Once I put the pot in, I'll throw the top, the shreddings on top of it and then the cover on top. So now we're ready to go. All we need to do is wait for the pots to get up to temperature and then we can pull them out. So if we didn't want to use or didn't have access to the uh, pine needles and the shredded uh, bills, we could actually use newspaper and we can roll up the newspaper, also put it around there. That's going to give you a little bit different effect. Sometimes the chemicals in the ink of the newspaper will give you some different color flashing on your pots. Here we also have from a local workshop, somebody has given us some cedar shavings. Right, cedar shavings will also give you just will burn a little bit hotter in certain spots and uh, may give you a little different effect on your pot. So we'll put a few of those in, and uh, sometimes people actually put some chemicals in the wood shavings and some copper carbonate, some cobalt that might give you some different different uh, reaction on the pot. So we'll leave this nest here, and then we'll take a look at it when we're going to put the hot pot in, and then we'll. Also take a look when the pot's done and see what it looks like. Okay, we are uh, three quarters of the way through the process right here. If I look at the digital pyrometer, we're at uh, 1,683 degrees Fahrenheit. The maturing temperature of this raku that we have in here is going to be about 1875. So it'll slowly creep up to 1875 and then we'll be able to lift the top and uh, pull the hot pots out. Now, another way to check and see whether the pots are ready if you don't have a digital pyrometer is you can do a visual inspection of the pots. In looking in at, at the pots that are on the top shelf, I can see that the glazes are somewhat bubbled, which means that they're still immature, they're still heating. When they get up to about 1800 degrees, they will turn bright orange and smooth over. When we see that, we know that they're getting very close. We give all of the artists an alert that we're a couple minutes away from pulling the pots. And then as you'll see in a couple minutes, this place will be a frenzy of smoke and moving, flying arms and legs. So in a minute, we'll be ready to pull another couple hundred degrees. So most of us potters have our own studios at home. And uh, while that serves its purpose probably for production work, it doesn't really give you a big artistic outlet. So we really find a lot of benefit in the community of potters where we come together for a workshop like this, see each other's techniques, get ideas from somebody else, share glazes, share horror stories of things that didn't work out well. Um, and the, the whole idea of art, whether it be art with pottery, whether it be woodworking, uh, any kind of art, painting, something that you're doing with your, your hands, uh, is certainly a good outlet. Speaking from my own experience, I was an information systems professional where the art side of it was absolutely very remote. So this actually lets me work the opposite side of my brain and, and have a little bit of creative outlet. And you can generate a lot of satisfaction by seeing the work that's produced and also trying different things and uh, understanding how the processes and the chemicals and the clays all work together. So we've got a nice little community here. Everyone is busily decorating and glazing their pots. You can see here from Kathy is uh, support your local potter. We certainly believe that's important. Now we don't want to just show her back, but uh, um, we certainly believe in supporting your local potter. We've got Chris, who's my fireman today busily doing some glazing over here. Elaine. 
And of course, Mrs. Marcus. Say your name. Patty. And Patty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These are all local potters, fairly local. I think some folks have come from as far away as maybe an hour, hour and a half away to uh, partake in the uh, workshop that we've got going here today. And uh, we do a number of different ones during the summer. Uh, different techniques, generally all related to pottery. Uh, Marlene over to your left is uh, actually a sculptor and uh, show her your mask. Uh, they do some uh, mask workshop and a number of other types of sculpture, which uh, for me being kind of a wheel throwing potter, um, doing sculpture is a completely different medium and uh, it's, really, it's really fun to do. It's really fun to challenge yourself on something you haven't done before. This is Kathy, who's another uh, sculptor, also local sculptor. Done some nice work. You can see maybe some sculpture work on the far wall over there, where they've done some masks in the workshop and some other types of sculpture. Um, different techniques, different. I see a red ribbon over there in the upper left, which means that somebody must have won a prize at the fair. So we get an opportunity to show our work both here at the Quail Gallery as well as uh, local county fair and uh, other possible art shops that do some consignment. So as Kathy's t-shirt said, please support your local potter. Um, 
I think it is. Okay, and now we're done with uh, the day's uh, pottery firing, the raku firing, and uh, we'll talk about a few different pieces that we have here. What's important to a raku artist is that actually black is part of the artist's palette. As you can see from here, black is used to actually be one of the colors that's used in the composition of the piece. You've got some other items where you use different textures. Here we see a piece that has what's called a lava glaze that is very rough and pebbly on the surface and then a different glaze is on the bottom where it gets nice metallic colors. Again, the metallic it comes from the reduction chamber when all of the oxygen is burned out. You also have here a combination of something that we call white crackle. We talked earlier about the fact that these glazes are mixed purposely to crackle and it allows the smoke from the reduction chamber to get in and detail these cracks. Very sought after and uh, very elegant looking. Uh, here we see a piece that has um, been reduced uh, selectively with the materials that are put in the combustion chamber where you'll get a nice green which is the natural color of the glaze and then a flashing of copper, so this pot was probably leaning up against some burning pine needles or newspaper, which actually flashed the copper in here. So again, we also have uh, where black is mixed into the palette, a contrast, a yin and yang, if you will, of the shiny and the matte. Another uh, technique which is done in a raku kiln is uh, a very popular technique which is called horsehair where you take a hot pot that has no glaze on it whatsoever and you take the tail from a horse and as the pot is cooling down through about 1300 degrees Fahrenheit you actually lay the horse tail hair on the pot and it burns on and the chemicals in the horse's tail actually create an oxidation line on the pot. Very nice, um, very nice treatment. You see a little smoke coming off there. So uh, well, you see quite a combination of thrown pots, also pots that are thrown and altered, some nice lidded forms which uh, make very nice gifts. Um, and we've got certainly sculpture here going into the human form which is also very nice. We got some nice comments about these today when we were pulling them out of the kiln. So that is the end of our pottery workshop and again I want to remind you this is all done at Quail Kilns in Murphy's California and I would tell you to call the number is 209-728-3562 but it would be a lot better to stop by and see all the work that's being done here during the week as well as the uh, workshops on the weekend so stay tuned and uh, give us a call and come on out and see us and sign up for our workshop next spring Thanks.